Fernley Abbey by Percival Landon Three years ago I was on my way out to the east, and as an extra day in London was of some importance, I took the Friday evening mail train to Brindisi, instead of the usual Thursday morning Marseille Express. Many people shrink from the long forty-eight-hour train journey through Europe, and the subsequent rush across the Mediterranean on the nineteen-knot Isis or Osiris, but there is really very little discomfort on either the train or the mailboat, and unless there is actually nothing for me to do, I always like to save the extra day and a half in London before I say good-bye to her for one of my longer tramps. This time, it was early, I remember, in the shipping season, probably about the beginning of September. There were few passengers, and I had a compartment in the P&O Indian Express to myself, all the way from Calais. All Sunday I watched the blue waves dimpling the Adriatic, and the pale rosemary along the cuttings, the plain white towns, with their flat roofs and their bold duomos, and the grey-green gnarled olive orchards of Apulia. The journey was just like any other. We ate in the dining-car as often and as long as we decently could. We slept after luncheon. We dawdled the afternoon away with yellow-backed novels. Sometimes we exchanged platitudes in the smoking-room, and it was there that I met Alistair Colvin. Colvin was a man of middle height, with a resolute, well-cut jaw. His hair was turning grey, his moustache was sun-whitened, otherwise he was clean-shaven, obviously a gentleman, and obviously also a preoccupied man. He had no great wit. When spoken to, he made the usual remarks in the right way, and I dare say he refrained from banalities only because he spoke less than the rest of us. Most of the time he buried himself in the wagon Lee Company's timetable, but seemed unable to concentrate his attention on any one page of it. He found that I had been over the Siberian railway, and for a quarter of an hour he discussed it with me. Then he lost interest in it, and rose to go to his compartment. But he came back again very soon, and seemed glad to pick up the conversation again. Of course, this did not seem to me to be of any importance. Most travellers by train become a trifle infirm of purpose after thirty-six hours rattling. But Colvin's restless way I noticed in somewhat marked contrast with the man's personal importance and dignity. Especially ill-suited was it to his finely made large hand, with strong, broad, regular nails, and its few lines. As I looked at his hand, I noticed a long, deep, and recent scar of ragged shape. However, it is absurd to pretend that I thought anything was unusual. I went off at five o'clock on Sunday afternoon to sleep away the hour or two that had still to be got through before we arrived at Brindisi. Once there, we few passengers transshipped our hand baggage, verified our berths, there were only a score of us in all, and then, after an aimless ramble of half an hour in Brindisi, we returned to dinner at the Hotel International, not wholly surprised that the town had been the death of Virgil. If I remember rightly, there is a gaily painted hall at the International. I do not wish to advertise anything, but there is no other place in Brindisi at which to await the coming of the mails, and after dinner I was looking with awe at a trellis overgrown with blue vines when Colvin moved across the room to my table. He picked up Il Secolo, but almost immediately gave up the pretense of reading it. He turned squarely to me and said, Would you do me a favour? One doesn't do favours to stray acquaintances on Continental Expresses without knowing something more of them than I knew of Colvin. But I smiled in a non-committal way and asked him what he wanted. I wasn't wrong in part of my estimate of him. He said bluntly, Will you let me sleep in your cabin on the Osiris? And he coloured a little as he said it. Now, there is nothing more tiresome than having to put up with a stable companion at sea.
and I asked him, rather pointedly, "'Surely there is room for all of us?' I thought that perhaps he had been partnered off with some mangy Levantine, and wanted to escape from him at all hazards. Colvin, still somewhat confused, said, "'Yes, I am in a cabin by myself, but you would do me the greatest favour if you would allow me to share yours.' This was all very well, but besides the fact that I always sleep better when alone, there had been some recent thefts on board English liners, and I hesitated, frank and honest and self-conscious as Colvin was. Just then the mail train came in with a clatter and a rush of escaping steam, and I asked him to see me again about it on the boat when we started. He answered me curtly. I suppose he saw the mistrust in my manner. I am a member of White's. I smiled to myself as he said it, but I remembered in a moment that the man, if he were really what he claimed to be, and I make no doubt that he was, must have been sorely put to it, before he urged the fact as a guarantee of his respectability to a total stranger at a Brindisi hotel. That evening, as we cleared the red and green harbour lights of Brindisi, Colvin explained. This is his story, in his own words. When I was travelling in India, some years ago, I made the acquaintance of a youngish man in the woods and forests. We camped out together for a week, and I found him a pleasant companion. John Broughton was a light-hearted soul when off duty, but a steady and capable man in any of the small emergencies that continually arise in that department. He was liked and trusted by the natives, and though a trifle overpleased with himself when he escaped to civilization at Simla or Calcutta, Broughton's future was well assured in government service when a fair-sized estate was unexpectedly left to him, and he joyfully shook the dust of the Indian plains from his feet and returned to England. For five years he drifted about London. I saw him now and then. We dined together about every eighteen months, and I could trace pretty exactly the gradual sickening of Broughton with a merely idle life. He then set out on a couple of long voyages, returned as restless as before, and at last told me that he had decided to marry and settle down at his place, Thurnley Abbey, which had long been empty. He spoke about looking after the property, and standing for his constituency, in the usual way. Vivian Wilde, his fiancée, had, I suppose, begun to take him in hand. She was a pretty girl, with a deal of fair hair, and rather an exclusive manner. Deeply religious in a narrow school, she was still kindly and high-spirited, and I thought that Broughton was in luck. He was quite happy, and full of information about his future. Among other things, I asked him about Thurnley Abbey. He confessed that he hardly knew the place. The last tenant, a man called Clark, had lived in one wing for fifteen years, and seen no one. He had been a miser and a hermit. It was the rarest thing for a light to be seen at the abbey after dark. Only the barest necessities of life were ordered, and the tenant himself received them at the side door. His one half-caste manservant, after a month's stay in the house, had abruptly left without warning, and had returned to the southern states. One thing Broughton complained bitterly about. Clark had willfully spread the rumour among the villagers that the abbey was haunted, and had even condescended to play childish tricks with spirit lamps and salt in order to scare trespassers away at night. He had been detected in the act of this tomfoolery, but the story spread, and no one, said Broughton, would venture near the house except in broad daylight. The hauntedness of Thurnley Abbey was now, he said with a grin, part of the gospel of the countryside. But he and his young wife were going to change all that. Would I propose myself any time I liked, 
I, of course, said I would, and equally, of course, intended to do nothing of the sort, without a definite invitation. The house was put in thorough repair, though not a stick of the old furniture and tapestry were removed. Floors and ceilings were relaid. The roof was made watertight again, and the dust of half a century was scoured out. He showed me some photographs of the place. It was called an abbey, though, as a matter of fact, it had only been the infirmary of the long-vanished Abbey of Kloster, some five miles away. The larger part of the building remained as it had been in pre-Reformation days, but a wing had been added in Jacobean times, and that part of the house had been kept in something like repair by Mr. Clark. He had, in both the ground and first floors, set a heavy timber door, strongly barred with iron, in the passage between the earlier and the Jacobean parts of the house, and had entirely neglected the former so there had been a good deal of work to be done. Broughton, whom I saw in London two or three times about this period, made a deal of fun over the positive refusal of the workmen to remain after sundown. Even after the electric light had been put into every room, nothing would induce them to remain, though, as Broughton observed, electric light was death on ghosts. The legend of the Abbey's ghosts had gone far and wide, and the men would take no risks. They went home in batches of five and six, and even during the daylight hours there was an inordinate amount of talking between one and another, if either happened to be out of sight of his companion. On the whole, though nothing of any sort or kind had been conjured up, even by their heated imaginations during their five months' work upon the Abbey, the belief in the ghosts was rather strengthened than otherwise in Thernley, because of the men's confessed nervousness, and local tradition declared itself in favour of the ghost of an immured nun. "'Good old nun,' said Broughton. I asked him whether in general he believed in the possibility of ghosts, and, rather to my surprise, he said that he couldn't say he entirely disbelieved in them. A man in India had told him one morning in camp that he believed that his mother was dead in England, as her vision had come to his tent the night before. He had not been alarmed, but had said nothing, and the figure vanished again. As a matter of fact, the next possible Dakwalla brought on a telegram, announcing the mother's death. "'There the thing was,' said Broughton but at Thernley he was practical enough. He roundly cursed the idiotic selfishness of Clark, whose silly antics had caused all the inconvenience. At the same time, he couldn't refuse to sympathise to some extent with the ignorant workmen. "'My own idea,' said he, "'is that if a ghost ever does come in one's way, one ought to speak to it.' I agreed, Little as I knew of the ghost world and its conventions, I had always remembered that a spook was in honour bound to wait to be spoken to. It didn't seem much to do, and I felt that the sound of one's own voice would, at any rate, reassure oneself as to one's wakefulness. But there are few ghosts outside Europe, few, that is, that a white man can see, and I had never been troubled with any. However, as I have said, I told Broughton that I agreed. So the wedding took place, and I went to it in a tall hat which I bought for the occasion, and the new Mrs. Broughton smiled very nicely at me afterwards. As it had to happen, I took the Orient Express that evening, and was not in England again for nearly six months. Just before I came back I got a letter from Broughton, he asked if I could see him in London, or come to Thernley, as he thought I should be better able to help him than anyone else he knew. His wife sent a nice message to me at the end, so I was reassured about at least one thing. I wrote from Budapest that I would come and see him at Thernley two days after my arrival in London, and as I sauntered out of the Pannonia into the Kerepeshi Utka,
to post my letters, I wondered of what earthly service I could be to Broughton. I had been out with him after Tiger on foot, and I could imagine few men better able at a pinch to manage their own business. However, I had nothing to do, so, after dealing with some small accumulations of business during my absence, I packed a kit bag and departed to Euston. I was met by Broughton's great limousine at Thurnley Road Station, and after a drive of nearly seven miles we echoed through the sleepy streets of Thurnley Village, into which the main gates of the park thrust themselves, splendid with pillars and spread eagles and tomcats rampant atop of them. I never was a herald, but I know that the Broughtons have the right to supporters. Heaven knows why. From the gates a quadruple avenue of beech trees led inwards for a quarter of a mile. Beneath them a neat strip of fine turf edged the road, and ran back until the poison of the dead beech-leaves killed it under the trees. There were many wheel-tracks on the road, and a comfortable little pony-trap jogged past me, laden with a country parson and his wife and daughter. Evidently there was some garden-party going on at the abbey. The road dropped away to the right at the end of the avenue, and I could see the abbey across a wide pasturage and a broad lawn thickly dotted with guests. The end of the building was plain. It must have been almost mercilessly austere when it was first built, but time had crumbled the edges and toned the stone down to an orange lichened grey, wherever it showed behind its curtain of magnolia, jasmine, and ivy. Farther on was the three-storied Jacobean house, tall and handsome, there had not been the slightest attempt to adapt the one to the other, but the kindly ivy had glossed over the touching point. There was a tall flesh in the middle of the building, surmounting a small bell-tower. Behind the house there rose the mountainous verdure of Spanish chestnuts all the way up the hill. Broughton had seen me coming from afar, and walked across from his other guests to welcome me, before turning me over to the butler's care. This man was sandy-haired, and rather inclined to be talkative. He could, however, answer hardly any questions about the house. He had, he said, only been there three weeks. Mindful of what Broughton had told me, I made no inquiries about ghosts, though the room into which I was shown might have justified anything. It was a very large, low room, with oak beams projecting from the white ceiling. Every inch of the walls, including the doors, was covered with tapestry, and a remarkably fine Italian four-post bedstead, heavily draped, added to the darkness and dignity of the place. All the furniture was old, well-made, and dark. Underfoot there was a plain green pile carpet, the only new thing about the room except the electric light fittings and the jugs and basins. Even the looking-glass on the dressing-table was an old pyramidal Venetian glass set in heavy repoussé frame of tarnished silver. After a few minutes cleaning up, I went downstairs and out upon the lawn, where I greeted my hostess. The people gathered there were of the usual country type, all anxious to be pleased, and roundly curious as to the new master of the abbey. Rather to my surprise, and quite to my pleasure, I rediscovered Glenham, whom I had known well in the old days in Barotsiland. He lived quite close, as, he remarked with a grin, I ought to have known. But, he added, I don't live in a place like this. He swept his hand to the long, low lines of the abbey, in obvious admiration, and then, to my intense interest, muttered beneath his breath, "'Thank God!' He saw that I had overheard him, and, turning to me, said decidedly, "'Yes, thank God,' I said, and I meant it. I wouldn't live at the Abbey for all Broughton's money.' "'But surely,' I demurred, 
you know that old Clark was discovered in the very act of setting light on his bugaboos. Glenham shrugged his shoulders. Yes, I know about that. But there is something wrong with the place still. All I can say is that Broughton is a different man since he has lived there. I don't believe that he will remain much longer, but you're staying here? Well, you'll hear all about it tonight. There's a big dinner, I understand. The conversation turned off to old reminiscences, and Glenham, soon after, had to go. Before I went to dress that evening, I had twenty minutes' talk with Broughton in his library. There was no doubt that the man was altered, gravely altered. He was nervous and fidgety, and I found him looking at me only when my eye was off him. I naturally asked him what he wanted of me. I told him I would do anything I could, but that I couldn't conceive what he lacked that I could provide. He said with a lustreless smile that there was, however, something, and that he would tell me the following morning. It struck me that he was somehow ashamed of himself, and perhaps ashamed of the part he was asking me to play. However, I dismissed the subject from my mind, and went up to dress in my palatial room. As I shut the door, a draught blew out the Queen of Sheba from the wall, and I noticed that the tapestries were not fastened to the wall at the bottom. I have always held very practical views about spooks, and it has often seemed to me that the slow waving in firelight of loose tapestry upon a wall would account for ninety-nine per cent of the stories one hears. Certainly the dignified undulation of this lady, with her attendants and huntsmen, one of whom was untidily cutting the throat of a fallow deer upon the very steps on which King Solomon, a grey-faced Flemish nobleman, with the order of the Golden Fleece, awaited his fair visitor, gave colour to my hypothesis. Nothing much happened at dinner. The people were very much like those of the garden party. A young woman next me seemed anxious to know what was being read in London. As she was far more familiar than I with the most recent magazines and literary supplements, I found salvation in being myself instructed in the tendencies of modern fiction. All true art, she said, was shot through and through with melancholy. How vulgar were the attempts at wit that marked so many modern books! From the beginning of literature it had always been tragedy that embodied the highest attainment of every age. To call such works morbid merely begged the question. No thoughtful man! She looked sternly at me through the steel rim of her glasses could fail to agree with me. Of course, as one would, I immediately and properly said that I slept with Pet Ridge and Jacobs under my pillow at night, and that if Jorrocks weren't quite so large and cornery, I would add him to the company. She hadn't read any of them, so I was saved, for a time. But I remember grimly that she said that the dearest wish of her life was to be in some awful and soul-freezing situation of horror, and I remember that she dealt hardly with the hero of Nat Painter's vampire story, between nibbles at her brown-bread ice. She was a cheerless soul, and I couldn't help thinking that if there were many such in the neighbourhood, it was not surprising that old Glenham had been stuffed with some nonsense or other about the Abbey. Yet nothing could well have been less creepy than the glitter of silver and glass, and the subdued lights and cackle of conversation all round the dinner-table. After the ladies had gone, I found myself talking to the rural dean. He was a thin, earnest man, who at once turned the conversation to old Clark's buffooneries. But, he said, Mr. Broughton had introduced such a new and cheerful spirit, not only into the Abbey, but, he might say, into the whole neighbourhood, that he had great hopes that the ignorant superstitions of the past were from henceforth destined to oblivion. Chapter 
thereupon his other neighbour, a portly gentleman of independent means and position, audibly remarked, Amen, which damped the rural dean, and we talked of partridges past, partridges present, and pheasants to come. At the other end of the table, Broughton sat with a couple of his friends, red-faced hunting men. Once I noticed that they were discussing me, but I paid no attention to it at the time. I remembered it a few hours later. By eleven all the guests were gone, and Broughton, his wife, and I were alone together under the fine plaster ceiling of the Jacobean drawing-room. Mrs. Broughton talked about one or two of the neighbours, and then, with a smile, said that she knew I would excuse her, shook hands with me, and went off to bed. I am not very good at analysing things, but I felt that she talked a little uncomfortably, and with a suspicion of effort, smiled rather conventionally, and was obviously glad to go. These things seem trifling enough to repeat, but I had throughout the faint feeling that everything was not quite square. Under the circumstances, this was enough to set me wondering what on earth the service could be that I was to render, wondering also whether the sole business were not some ill-advised jest in order to make me come down from London for a mere shooting party. Broughton said little after she had gone, but he was evidently labouring to bring the conversation round to the so-called haunting of the Abbey. As soon as I saw this, of course, I asked him directly about it. He then seemed at once to lose interest in the matter. There was no doubt about it. Broughton was somehow a changed man, and to my mind he had changed in no way for the better. Mrs. Broughton seemed to know sufficient cause— he was clearly very fond of her, and she of him. I reminded him that he was going to tell me what I could do for him in the morning, pleaded my journey, lighted a candle, and went upstairs with him. At the end of the passage leading into the old house, he grinned weakly and said, Mind, if you see a ghost, do talk to it. You said you would. He stood irresolutely a moment and then turned away. At the door of his dressing-room he paused once more. "'I'm here,' he called out, "'if you should want anything. Good night.' And he shut the door. I went along the passage to my room, undressed, switched on a lamp beside my bed, read a few pages of the jungle book, and then, more than ready for sleep, turned the light off, and went fast asleep. Three hours later I woke up. There was not a breath of wind outside. There was not even a flicker of light from the fireplace. As I lay there an ash tinkled slightly as it cooled, but there was hardly a gleam of the dullest red in the grate. An owl cried among the silent Spanish chestnuts on the slope outside. I idly reviewed the events of the day, hoping that I should fall off to sleep again before I reached dinner. But at the end I seemed as wakeful as ever. There was no help for it. I must read my jungle book again till I felt ready to go off. So I fumbled for the pair at the end of the cord that hung down inside the bed, and I switched on the bedside lamp. The sudden glory dazzled me for a moment. I felt under my pillow for my book with half-shut eyes. Then, growing used to the light, I happened to look down to the foot of my bed. I can never tell you, really, what happened then. Nothing I could ever confess, in the most abject words, could even faintly picture to you what I felt. I know that my heart— stopped dead, and my throat shut automatically. In one instinctive movement I crouched back up against the headboards of the bed, staring at the horror. The movement 
set my heart going again, and the sweat dripped from every pore. I am not a particularly religious man, but I had always believed that God would never allow any supernatural appearance to present itself to man in such a guise and in such circumstances that harm, either bodily or mental, could result to him. I can only tell you that, at the moment, both my life and my reason rocked unsteadily on their seats. The other Osiris passengers had gone to bed. Only he and I remained, leaning over the starboard railing, which rattled uneasily now and then under the fierce vibration of the over-engined mailboat. Far over, there were the lights of a few fishing smacks riding out the night, and a great rush of white, combing, and seething water fell out and away from us overside. At last Colvin went on. Leaning over the foot of my bed, looking at me, was a figure swathed in a rotten and tattered veiling. This shroud passed over the head, but left both eyes and the right side of the face bare. It then followed the line of the arm down to where the hand grasped the bed-end. The face was not entirely that of a skull, though the eyes and the flesh of the face were totally gone. There was a thin, dry skin drawn tightly over the features, and there was some skin left on the hand. One wisp of hair crossed the forehead. It was perfectly still. I looked at it, and it looked at me, and my brains turned dry and hot in my head. I had still got the pair of the electric lamp in my hand, and I played idly with it, only I dared not turn the light out again. I shut my eyes, only to open them in a hideous terror the same second. The thing had not moved. My heart was thumping, and the sweat cooled me as it evaporated. Another cinder tinkled in the grate, and a panel creaked in the wall. My reason failed me. For twenty minutes, or twenty seconds, I was able to think of nothing else but this awful figure, till there came hurtling through the empty channels of my senses, the remembrances that Broughton and his friends had discussed me furtively at dinner. The dim possibility of its being a hoax stole gratefully into my unhappy mind, and, once there, one's pluck came creeping back along a thousand tiny veins. My first sensation was one of blind, unreasoning thankfulness that my brain was going to stand the trial. I am not a timid man, but the best of us needs some human handle to steady him in time of extremity, and in this faint but growing hope that, after all, it might be only a brutal hoax, I found the fulcrum that I needed. At last I moved. How I managed to do it I cannot tell you, but with one spring towards the foot of the bed I got within arm's length and struck out one fearful blow with my fist at the thing. It crumbled under it, and my hand was cut to the bone. With a sickening revulsion after my terror I dropped half fainting across the end of the bed. So it was merely a foul trick, after all. No doubt the trick had been played many a time before. No doubt Broughton and his friends had had some large bet among themselves as to what I should do when I discovered the gruesome thing. From my state of abject terror 
I found myself transported into an insensate anger. I shouted curses upon Broughton. I dived rather than climbed over the bed-end of the sofa. I tore at the robed skeleton. How well the whole thing had been carried out, I thought. I broke the skull against the floor and stamped upon its dry bones. I flung the head away under the bed and rent the brittle bones of the trunk in pieces. I snapped the thin thigh bones across my knee and flung them in different directions. The shin bones I set up against a stool and broke with my heel. I raged like a berserker against the loathly thing and stripped the ribs from the backbone and slung the breastbone against the cupboard. My fury increased as the work of destruction went on. I tore the frail, rotten veil into twenty pieces, and the dust went up over everything, over the clean blotting paper and the silver inkstand. At last my work was done. There was but a raffle of broken bones and strips of parchment and crumbling wool. Then, picking up a piece of the skull— it was the cheek and temple bone of the right side, I remember. I opened the door and went down the passage to Broughton's dressing-room. I remember still how my sweat-dripping pyjamas clung to me as I walked. At the door I kicked and entered. Broughton was in bed. He had already turned the light on and seemed shrunken and horrified. For a moment he could hardly pull himself together. Then I spoke. I don't know what I said. Only I know that from a heart full and overfull, with hatred and contempt, spurred on by shame of my own recent cowardice, I let my tongue run on. He answered nothing. I was amazed at my own fluency. My hair still clung lankily to my wet temples. My hand was bleeding profusely, and I must have looked a strange sight. Broughton huddled himself at the head of the bed, just as I had. Still, he made no answer, no defence. He seemed preoccupied with something besides my reproaches, and once or twice moistened his lips with his tongue. But he could say nothing, though he moved his hands now and then, just as a baby who cannot speak moves its hands. At last the door into Mrs. Broughton's rooms opened, and she came in, white and terrified. "'What is it? What is it? Oh, in God's name, what is it?' she cried again and again. And then she went up to her husband, and sat on the bed in her nightdress, and the two faced me. I told her what the matter was. I spared her husband not a word for her presence there. Yet he seemed hardly to understand. I told the pair that I had spoiled their cowardly joke for them. Broughton looked up. "'I have smashed the foul thing into a hundred pieces,' I said. Broughton licked his lips again, and his mouth worked. "'By God!' I shouted. It would serve you right if I thrashed you within an inch of your life. I will take care that not a decent man or woman of my acquaintance ever speaks to you again. And there, I added, throwing the broken piece of the skull upon the floor beside his bed, there is a souvenir for you of your damned work tonight. Broughton saw the bone, and in a moment it was his turn to frighten me. He squealed like a hare caught in a trap. He screamed and screamed till Mrs. Broughton, almost as bewildered as myself, held on to him and coaxed him like a child to be quiet. But Broughton, and as he moved, I thought that ten minutes ago, I perhaps looked as terribly ill as he did, thrust her from him and scrambled out of bed onto the floor and still screaming, put out his hand to the bone. It had blood on it from my hand. He paid no attention to me whatsoever. In truth, I said nothing. 
This was a new turn, indeed, to the horrors of the evening. He rose from the floor with a bone in his hand and stood silent. He seemed to be listening. Time, time, perhaps, he muttered, and almost at the same moment fell at full length on the carpet, cutting his head against the fender. The bone flew from his hand and came to rest near the door. I picked Broughton up, haggard and broken, with blood over his face. He whispered hoarsely and quickly, Listen! Listen! We listened. After ten seconds utter quiet, I seemed to hear something. I could not be sure, but at last there was no doubt. There was a quiet sound, as one moving along the passage. Little regular steps came towards us over the hard oak flooring. Broughton moved to where his wife sat, white and speechless, on the bed, and pressed her face into his shoulder. Then, the last thing that I could see as he turned the light out, he fell forward with his own head pressed into the pillow of the bed. Something in their company, something in their cowardice, helped me, and I faced the open doorway of the room, which was outlined fairly clearly against the dimly lighted passage. I put out one hand and touched Mrs. Broughton's shoulder in the darkness, but at the last moment I too failed. I sank on my knees and put my face in the bed. Only we all heard. The footsteps came to the door, and there they stopped. The piece of bone was lying a yard inside the door. There was a rustle of moving stuff, and the thing was in the room. Mrs. Broughton was silent. I could hear Broughton's voice praying, muffled in the pillow. I was cursing my own cowardice. Then the steps moved out again on the oak boards of the passage, and I heard the sounds dying away. In a flash of remorse I went to the door and looked out. At the end of the corridor I thought I saw something that moved away. A moment later the passage was empty. I stood with my forehead against the jamb of the door, almost physically sick. You can turn the light on, I said, and there was an answering flare. There was no bone at my feet. Mrs. Broughton had fainted. Broughton was almost useless, and it took me ten minutes to bring her to. Broughton only said one thing worth remembering. For the most part he went on muttering prayers, but I was glad afterwards to recollect that he had said that thing. He said, in a colourless voice, half as a question, half as a reproach, You didn't speak to her. We spent the remainder of the night together. Mrs. Broughton actually fell off into a kind of sleep before dawn, but she suffered so horribly in her dreams that I shook her into consciousness again. Never was dawn so long in coming. Three or four times Broughton spoke to himself. Mrs. Broughton would then just tighten her hold on his arm, but she could say nothing. As for me, I can honestly say that I grew worse as the hours passed and the light strengthened. The two violent reactions had battered down my steadiness of view, and I felt that the foundations of my life had been built upon the sand. I said nothing, and, after binding up my hand with a towel, I did not move. It was better so. They helped me, and I helped them, and we all three knew that our reason 
had gone very near to ruin that night. At last, when the light came in pretty strongly, and the birds outside were chattering and singing, we felt that we must do something. Yet we never moved. You might have thought that we should particularly dislike being found, as we were, by the servants. Yet nothing of that kind mattered a straw, and an overpowering listlessness bound us as we sat, until Chapman, Broughton's man, actually knocked and opened the door. None of us moved. Broughton, speaking hardly and stiffly, said, Chapman, you can come back in five minutes. Chapman was a discreet man, but it would have made no difference to us if he had carried his news to the room at once. We looked at each other, and I said I must go back. I meant to wait outside till Chapman returned. I simply dared not re-enter my bedroom alone. Broughton roused himself and said that he would come with me. Mrs. Broughton agreed to remain in her own room for five minutes, if the blinds were drawn up and all the doors left open. So Broughton and I, leaning stiffly one against the other, went down to my room. By the morning light that filtered past the blinds, we could see our way, and I released the blinds. There was nothing wrong with the room from end to end, except smears of my own blood on the end of the bed, on the sofa, and on the carpet, where I had torn the thing to pieces. Colvin had finished his story. There was nothing to say. Seven bells stuttered out from the forecastle, and the answering cry wailed through the darkness. I took him downstairs. Of course, I am much better now, but it is a kindness of you to let me sleep in your cabin. You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook. We hope you enjoyed it. More classic short stories from the 19th and early 20th centuries from a range of British authors are available on our channel. Please try the links below, and do click subscribe if you'd like to receive updates. Thank you for listening.